Good evening and welcome to the January 11, 2016 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, could you please take the roll? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. Wood? Here. And Ms. Saunders? Here. Thank you, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I'd like to welcome our newest member, Robin Saunders, down Thank here at the end. Me. Thank you. Which brings a, a good background, which I'm sure will be a, a good asset to the board. Uh, the next item is the approval of minutes from the December 7th, 2015 meeting. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, Section 9, Performance Standards, Subsection O, Solar Systems, Solar Energy Systems. Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Introduce this one. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an initiative to, to really broaden the allowance for alternative energy in Scarborough, sp specifically solar panels um, that the Long Range Planning Committee worked on before uh, bringing it to the Council and, and now to the Planning Board. Um, obviously, solar power and, and also, to a lesser degree, wind energy is on the rise right now and has been for a while. Um, back in 2008-2009, uh, the Council and, and Planning Board at that time did a pretty comprehensive update to the Zoning Ordinance to clearly allow for solar panels on homes and businesses, um, wind turbines in the same kind of context, and actually uh, allowed wind turbines to be installed in common open space. Um, for residential neighborhoods in addition to other places. And for whatever reason at the time, um, that was thought about um, for a common open space, but solar panels were not. Um, and so recently we were approached by Habitat for Humanity, um, which is under construction on Broad Turn Road that this board reviewed some time ago with interest in putting in um, solar arrays so freestanding solar panels in their common land in addition to uh, solar panels on the roofs of the homes that it makes sense that have the proper orientation. Um, so the Long Range Planning Committee considered this, um, thought it was a, a good project, and also thought that um, the ordinance in general should allow for it in a residential context where um, there might be a neighborhood who wants to you know, have use solar panels in common land and, and have it um, power a portion of uh, the various homeowners' um, power needs. So this proposed amendment, um, like wind turbines for a number of years now, would allow for solar panels, solar arrays to be placed in, in common space um, within residential neighborhoods to, to kind of meet that, that interest. And so specifically in the amendment, there's um, already performance standards around kind of the size of solar panels and, and um, their specifications. And so these amendments would allow them in common open space of residential neighborhoods. Um, there are standards that suggest that they need to avoid wetland impacts, other kind of resource impacts that in many cases the open space is designed to, to preserve or protect. Um, there's also standards to ensure that the the number of panels, the size of the panels is in proportion to the neighborhood so that it's providing power needs for the neighborhood but not being a commercial kind of um, solar <coughs> installation. Um, and it also, there's an expectation that the planning board, um, obviously this board, would review these proposals. Um, so there could be instances where a new subdivision comes in and it's part of the original subdivision and it's sort of part of the feature and incorporated in the project initially. Um, or like with Habitat, it could be something that comes back to you after it's already been approved. There might be an established 
subdivision or one under construction where they might want to kind of take advantage of this. And the board could, could look at that and review and um, um, approve such a project. So that's really, a, in a nutshell, the, the background behind it and certainly can answer questions that if there's anybody in the public or the, the board has, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Dan. So this is a public hearing. Before we move on to any board discussion, I'll open this up to the public. Just ask that if anyone is interested in speaking, come up to the podium, introduce yourself, give your name and address, um, limit your comments to five minutes or less. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any takers? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And we'll turn to the board. Mike, do you have any? Um, sure, I just have a couple of quick. Um, to be clear, uh, through the chair to Dan, this may uh, reduce, if not eliminate, what we would otherwise expect to gain from open space in a uh, typical subdivision, if you will. I mean, for example, if you have like 10 acres that's been set aside as open space, maybe in, um, in exchange for a rec fee or anything of that nature, that open space may be completely um, taken up by the use of either solar or wind type facilities. I guess if it's, it really depends on obviously the size of the installation. So a smaller area of the open space could be consumed by, by this. Um, a larger open space area, probably not. You know, it really depends on, say, the number of homes in a subdivision, the amount of sort of solar panel installation that um, would be proposed. So it's kind of, it's hard to. Right, but uh, regard, we, I mean, that, that type of presentation would be brought before the planning board and we would, right. we would uh, discuss it at the time as to whether we thought that it was appropriate to dedicate all the open space to such a facility. Would that be correct? We could make a determination as to whether we would like to increase open space for just that conventional purpose and yep. idea as just being open space. Right. You could, and I, I think you can, the board has the ability to kind of weigh the merits of a proposal like this against, to, uh, against other important reasons for open space, because as you know, a lot of the open space subdivisions you see in the rural area in particular is required because of the amount of wetlands right. that are within a subdivision. So you're expecting conservation subdivisions to have open space that buffers and protects wetlands. And this is not intended to kind of compete against that. I think wetlands protection is still the, the primary goal in that context. So you could allow, say, solar panels on some uplands or areas that are not wetlands and still kind of meet that goal. Mm -hmm. In other areas like the Broad Turn Project, um, Habitat for Humanity. They're proposing the solar panels and they'll come to you to talk about it along the edge of their stormwater pond. You know, a location that's already developed. Um, it's not a conservation area or a natural resource area. It's, it's really part of their kind of stormwater infrastructure. So they're hoping that that makes sense um, to the board and isn't sort of competing with other needs of the open space. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I just think like when I when I think of like um, uh, Springbrook or Tenney Lane, and I think of the open space that was dedicated to the town, right. and then later the town decided to turn those into public parks, that we could be faced with making a, a judgment call as to whether we thought the open space would be better used for one over the other. Right. I think, and after the facts situation, in many cases, the homeowners collectively own the open space. Um, and so in that context, it would be the property owners of the neighborhood that would right. need to decide whether mm -hmm. a majority or collectively you want such an installation. So I think in a lot of neighborhoods, the, the, the residents probably hold the cards in terms of whether they'd want to pursue it. In newer developments, it would be the developer that would mm -hmm. make the decision. Uh, the, the other comment I had was uh, it, it speaks of these solar energy systems that they shall be determined by the, the planning board and based on forecasted energy consumption. 
of the uh, dwellings and uses within the subdivision. Is, is it too premature to have some sort of formula, per se, <clears throat> that we can expect to um, uh, use as a guideline as to what a typical three-bedroom, four-bedroom home might use for energy along the lines like we determine uh, uh, subsurface waste systems, et cetera? Mm -hmm. I think we could we could generate that before you're faced with a project, yep. so that you come come prepared for understanding what that looks like in kilowatt I, right. Yeah, I might be I might benefit from that because yeah. then I could get a a real good sense as to whether the size of this proposal is in keeping with the intent. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, so, in page two here on section B. The, the first section B up here. Um, it says, it says um, ordinance the installation of solar energy systems and any necessary associated improvements shall avoid impacting wetlands within the subdivision open space areas. Seems kind of, um, it's, it kind of seems like our hands get tied there. Whereas I wonder if there, somebody comes to us with a proposal and 200 square feet of wetlands might get impacted because of the underground wiring or whatever. I don't want to feel like we, we get our hands tied. I wonder if there's some sort of allowance that maybe the planning board could use as discretion for what's acceptable disturbance of a wetland area. And I, I just I didn't know if the language there was a little bit finite for those purposes, um, where they might have to make a you know a, a quick bridge over some wetlands to get to an upland area, and that we're not prevented from from stopping a, a developer from installing one of these systems because of a, a smaller impact. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that an area of concern from the way I'm reading this. Right. Okay. And I didn't know if um, a little further down Section 7 allowed for that. It, it does reference some planning board, you know, that we may have some, some leeway, but I'm just not sure if it's quite clear. And I, I think I'd hate to see this board get their hands tied, you know, uh, or stop a developer from putting in a system like this over over a small amount of wetlands impact. So that would be my one concern regarding yeah. the language. Other than that, I think it's um, I think it's a good move. So, thank you. Thank you. Ron? Yeah. Uh, I just have one question in addition to what my two colleagues have already expressed. Uh, on page one, Dan, uh, how did you come to the, uh, I, the 20 foot, 20 feet? I mean, what was that based on? That, that's been in the ordinance for six or seven years, and it was, at the time it was based on kind of research around kind of the maximum height of solar arrays. Those are the ground-mounted pedestal-style um, solar panels that are in wanting to ensure they kind of we allow for the industry what's typical in industry, but not allow um, very tall panels that are out of character with say, a residential neighborhood. So that was where that came from at that time. Um, I think that still holds true. I think they're typically, you know, pedestals typically, you know, 10 feet high, you know, eight or so feet high, and then the panels are angled and they're usually less than 20 feet. Um, but we can check that again, obviously, to make sure that that's still typical. Um, that's what was the research that we found back at that time, Ron. Thank you. I'm, I'm in agreement with my two colleagues over here. I think it's a good idea. Thanks, Ron. Susan? Um, <coughs> I see this basically as a um, little bit of a history story. We did a good job of creating an ordinance about around wind, but we weren't paying much attention to solar. Now it's much more solar than it is wind, and I just think this, this brings the ordinance to the point where it, either one are um, going to be able to be looked at by the board <coughs> more fully, and I think it's, a, it's meeting a need and um, being done well. So I appreciate the opportunity to provide solar panels as well as wind turbine. Thanks. Um, no, I, I, I think this is good as well. I think uh, my colleagues over there asked very good questions, and uh, it's just bringing solar in line with the uh, wind power. Uh, just kind of curious, have Dan through, you know, through Corey, uh, do we have any um, 
examples of, of the wind power in this situation? We have a few examples of individual installations at individual right, residential no group, properties. Not, no, no, um, you know, community or neighborhood. No. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Uh, yes, <clears throat> my questions were were two. I had two, and um, Mr. Mazur already asked the first one about the 20 foot um, sort of perspective and whether or not you know that took into account the recent installations and the sizing kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that's already been um, thought about. Um, my second comment or question would be looking at the existing language in number seven and ten. On page two, it says um, open space lands under number seven. It says open space lands may be designed to conserve wetlands and other natural resources. And then it, and down in 10, it says shall be usable for active or passive recreation and then for preserving large trees, tree groves, woods, ponds, streams, glens, rocks, outcrops. So, so there's a number of uh, sort of it, go, it goes to I think what um, Mr. McGee was saying as far as we don't we don't want to necessarily impact wetlands, but my question is about consistency. If up under number B, if it just says shall avoid impacting wetlands, and do we want to say and other natural resources to be consistent with those sections seven and ten down there, or am I mis? And please let me know if I'm misinterpreting because I don't want to have a limit the language and say, well, we just said we had to look at wetlands when, in fact, we may have needed to look at other natural resources as well, like vernal pools or, or other things to be consistent. Just a thought. Yeah, no, that's a good question. There's actually three or four different um, standards for open space mm -hmm. that this is referring to. Right. And um, the number 10 and then actually number six yep and number five on the later on page two and later on page three are in our those are sort of the common land or open space standards for our growth areas or areas that we're encouraging residential development where the ordinance is um, less protective of wetlands um, not to say it's, they're not important in those areas but that's an area where kind of development is a higher priority than in our rural area where we're, the zoning is currently quite sensitive to wetland preservation being the goal for open space. So I think that's why the standards are a little bit different. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that other natural resources shouldn't be referenced up, up in that higher section. I think the Long Range Planning Committee spent some time kind of talking about Kind of balancing those things, how um, protective of the natural resources we should be in those denser neighborhoods mm -hmm. where um, development <coughs> typically takes a fairly high priority compared to the rural area. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, See, so yeah, building on that last comment, um, the Long Range Planning Committee was very mindful of some of those questions and I think there was a general desire to um, have leave the board with some discretion to be able to protect those resources while being able to work with applicants so um, I think I'm hearing strong support for this given maybe a little bit of uh, verbiage tweaking and uh, we will send a positive recommendation and we'll look forward to seeing the revised ordinance Okay. Thank you. And just for the benefit of the public, um, the next step in this process is the council public hearing, um, and that's <coughs> that's going to be scheduled for um, next Wednesday, so that's January 20th. For those that are interested in continuing to follow this, that's when they'll be discussing it again. And Corey, the, <coughs> the town council will have our minutes, and yes, they'll be able to discern our comments. Right. Absolutely, Corey. Um, Again, uh, I wanted to ask Dan a question. Did I hear at the last council meeting that there was uh, some sort of guidelines as to how many of these uh, panels you can put into one of these areas? Or am I, did I hear something There's else? There's kind of two different 
sort of regulating factors. One is the language in here that says that the panel the number of panels need to be based on forecasted consumption of the subdivision. So it needs to be in proportion to the number of dwellings that are in a, a neighborhood. Um, and there's also through PUC regulation, Public Utilities Commission, there's um, there's parameters around how many um, kind of solar installations you can have on a given parcel. Um, so that too could kind of temper or limit the number of panels that could say go in a, a piece of open space. Um, so those are the two kind of things that would dictate number of panels, how much open space is really used by panels versus <coughs> being common open space. All right, and, and to Mike's, uh, one of Mike's comments, there was also some discussion at Long Ridge Planning about the notion of maybe having some sort of <laughs> peer review or whatever one might call it so that the board would have something to reference, some frame of reference. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm reminded a little bit of the, um, the cellular tower processes we've gone through recently <coughs> where we're sort of looking at, at data and um, it's always helpful to have some some something to sort of peg our discussion to so that we know we have some sense of what's what's reasonable. Thank you. Next item, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance section 18A, town and village centers district related to multifamily dwellings. Dan? Uh, thanks, Corey. Uh, this is another uh, initiative the Long Range Planning Committee has been working on in, in advance of bringing it to the council and, and to you as a board. Um, for the past five or five plus years, uh, we've been working on really kind of widening the range of housing styles, housing choices uh, in Scarborough, allowing better allowing for kind of mixed housing, multifamily housing. Um, also with a focus on kind of one and two bedroom units versus, you know, single family houses and, and, and three or four bedroom units. Um, and so the TVC district, our town and village center district um, that applies to the Oak Hill area and the Dunson area in particular allows right now for multifamily housing. Um, and the zoning in the TVC um, has standards around how big these buildings are. Um, right now, multifamily buildings are limited to 10,000 square feet in building footprint. Um, on a lot, they're limited to three stories or 45 feet. Um, and also our, our density uh, allowances kind of limit the size of the number of units uh, in a building or um, on a particular property. And in the TVC, five to eight units per acre is allowed based on how you how you propose them. Um, <coughs> in addition, there's a limit of 12 units per building right now for multifamily uh, structures. And that's the aspect of this that is um, being proposed to be amended where we've had some experience with the ordinance, we've had some experience with these standards, and um, in, in order to enable more kind of one and two bedroom units in a building, um, the Long Range Planning Committee is proposing to, to basically eliminate that limitation of 12 units per building um, because it's, it works fairly well for three bedroom units, um, three or four bedroom units, because if you take three or four bedroom units and you put kind of 12 together, that's a little bit less than a 10,000 square foot building. But if you put um, 12 one bedroom units, in a um, in a structure, then you're you're well below a 10,000 square foot building. You know you're in the, the 5,000 square foot range. So in an effort to enable more flexibility around creating these one and two bedroom units, but also you know still ensuring that they're in scale with other buildings in Oak Hill and Dunstan and kind of meet the the character and goals for for these areas, um, the Long Range Planning Committee felt that. Those goals still could be met. Buildings would still, on the exterior, be of the same size. They would just have more units if they were smaller units. Um, so that's really the essence around 
this proposal. It's a fairly simple amendment by eliminating that um, 12 unit per building kind of uh, standard. And I guess to, to kind of think about it in more recent terms, like the Avesta housing project that came forward uh, last summer and fall, one of the reasons they went for a contract zone versus just coming to the planning board for review is because of this the standard. Because um, they were proposing, you know, more units than 12, and they were proposing those one bedrooms and, and studio type units. Um, and there's also some projects in the future that are interested in doing these smaller units, but um, and want to comply with the other standards. Um, but this this particular one is a bit inhibiting. So that's that's why it's proposed through Long Range Planning Committee, and um, happy to answer questions if you have. Thanks, Dan. Uh, this is another public hearing, so once again, I'll invite anyone who would like to comment to come on up and introduce yourself and just limit your comments to five minutes or less. Oh, we have a taker. Somebody's got to get up. Uh, Elliot Chamberlain, Nottingham Drive. Um, Dan, I think, hit probably the vast majority of the points as to why this is a uh, pretty simplified amendment and why there are still many controls in place to uh, take care of, uh, uh, I think, the fear that some people might have by putting too many buildings in, a, in a, too many units in one building. On top of that, the ones he didn't mention was uh, coming to site plan review, somebody would still have to account for buffering to any neighboring property. They'd still have to meet setbacks. They'd still have to meet parking requirements. So it's not just about cramming units in a building. Um, you'd still have to meet all those other items. Um, and I'm sure if, if a building was completely out of scale for a particular property uh, that was before you, I'm, I'm sure that would get taken into consideration also. Um, I think the idea is if it's difficult to create small units and to still limit that number of 12 on a per building, and at the same time doesn't make sense to keep building a uh, multiple 12 unit buildings on the same property when you might be able to do 30, 40 uh, or so units that could be in one building if it was 10,000 square feet, three stories tall, uh, as long as you met all the other requirements. So um, there was a lot of different ways to try to accomplish this. I think the Long Range Planning Committee um, probably nailed it by going at it the way they did by just um, eliminating or hopefully eliminating this uh, number of uh, units per building. but. Um, uh, and all said and done, I'm greatly in favor of it and uh, look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll close this public hearing. And Susan, would you like to start us off on this one? <clears throat> I'm a member of the Long Range Planning Committee, and it seems that for something that basically ends up being such a simple change, <clears throat> that it might have been a simple process, but it wasn't. <laughs> we went through every conceivable uh, way of figuring out size of buildings and number of units, and I learned a great deal. And it did, it did seem that the answer was about as simple as, as it could possibly be. And I think that um, the point well, was well made that it's not like this, this is the only thing we're changing. All of the other things that we use in order to determine whether this actually fits into the community, et cetera, et cetera, will not change. So I'm very much in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, I'm in agreement with it also. I think it's a very reasonable change, uh, especially when you consider the um, demand for reasonable housing, you know, you know living, living quarters. So. I think it makes total sense to do this, and um, I'm totally in favor of it. Thank you, Robin. <coughs> yeah, I, I also was um, actually very happy to see this, um, and I'm wondering. Hmm, I guess my one question from the Long Range Planning Committee is, you know, when you think about one bedroom units, is is this primarily toward um, geared toward letting in like. Uh, of Vestas and or in encouraging more retirement type communities was that sort of part of the long range planning committee's hmm, goal to attract uh, more of that I guess I'm just looking for background information for well, like Susan I'm, I'm I'm long range planning committee um, and Susan can can pipe in 
certainly, but um, I guess I would say my sense of it was that it wasn't a driving Good. motivation. It was one mm -hmm. factor um, and I, as part of a kind of a general desire to um, want to accommodate a, a broader range of, of housing types. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, a fair way to it. It. We've, we've, we have created a, and I shouldn't put it that way, we've been increasingly interested in um, more and more ways of providing a wider variety of housing in, in our town. Perfect. And this just seemed to be a perfectly legitimate way of helping to make that happen. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Ron? No, I think it's keeping up with the times, and I commend the committee. Thank you. Dick? Dr. Nader? Mike? No, I'm in favor of it. Uh, the, uh, the scale, uh, net residential density, none of that changes. No. Right. no, I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Great. Uh, I don't really have anything to add other than to echo what's already been said. Um, fully support this, and we will send our positive recommendation to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, item number six. Martins Point Healthcare requests site plan review for 153 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U47, Lot 92. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> this project came before you as a sketch plan back in, I believe, October. Um, and it's now before you again for some additional review and feedback. They've work, been working hard on their plan since uh, reviewing it within September, or, uh, shaping their plans up for a, a final submission, I think in the next few weeks, looking for um, some review and approval at one of your next meetings. This is really kind of a check-in meeting to show you where they're at. Um, staff's taking the opportunity to work with the applicant to, to do a thorough review, and um, we provided the applicant and um, the board uh, staff review comments that get into a lot of kind of site plan details. Um, Water and current, our peer reviewers done the same, where they've scrutinized uh, the project, and uh, including stormwater, and working closely with our town engineer on working with the applicant on refining their stormwater approach. Um, and then the Bilbrey, our traffic reviewers, looked at the project and uh, I think has essentially signed off, thinks the project has the same or less impacts than the, the previous. Um, commercial, multi-tenant commercial building that existed. So um, that's kind of where we're at. I, I would say just a few kind of key considerations under staff comments. Um, one thing in looking at the project that there's, we think there's a, a good opportunity for is potential for some time in the future, an interconnection um, to the site to the, with the neighbor to the, the south. This site has the kind of the good fortune of a traffic signal. Um, and the neighboring site does not on a stretch of Route 1 that's not getting any less congested. So should that site change in some way, at least there could be an opportunity for a connection to get access to the traffic signal to kind of maintain good access management. Um, I think the project provides, you know, a good kind of parking layout. Um, one, of the thing that, one of the things that the board needs to do is uh, review kind of the shared parking proposal. There's going to be the kind of the medical office and, and that operation, and then hopefully some good community space that can um, take advantage of this site as the council is going to be working with the applicant on. And um, we think there's good opportunities for shared parking, but to find that it meets your ordinance, you just need to have that analysis broken down and, and kind of concur with um, the parking calculations to to make sure it's a good fit for shared parking. Um, and I guess other than that, we're working <coughs> with the, applica the applicant and the fire department just on some landscaping details to make sure it's a, a well landscaped site, but also has some, some strategic spots for, for emergency access and access to the building. So I think we've made good progress on that last week. So um, that's really where the project's at. And I, I think they're interested in your continued review. Thanks, Dan. And with that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Uh, good evening. My name is Dick Dagle. I'm the Vice President with uh, Mountains Point Healthcare. And I just want to give you a kind of a basic overview of, of Mountains Point and, and uh, this type of an operation. Um, we operate six primary care medical offices in the southern Maine area. 
and we worked on a strategic plan. We identified a number of locations, kind of target locations. So within the last two years, we opened up a site in Gorham. We located and opened up a site in Gorham. We recently locate, relocated a site in Biddeford, and the Scarborough <coughs> Route 1 area was our next targeted area. And we were very fortunate to come across this particular site um, and meeting with the property owners and coming to a, an agreement to allow us to develop the site. We think it's an ideal location for us. As Dan mentioned, the signalized entrance is always very popular with, with all of our locations. Um, so we're very excited about uh, going forward with this project. Um, with me this evening, I have uh, Kylie Mason with Surveyo Technics. She's going to give you an overview of the actual site plan design. Uh, Derek Bayou with SMIT Architects will give you kind of an overview of the building itself. You'll see that a lot of the features of the building are similar to our Gorham site and kind of our approach to brand the locations, uh, especially on the interior. Uh, so it was focused on kind of that patient experience of coming into a new uh, uh, medical office building. Um, after our approval, uh, it's our intent to work with PC Construction to construct the building. And our goal is to be in the ground as soon as feasible after the winter um, with a plan of opening the site in early 2017. That's kind of our, our target at this point. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kylie. And, uh, but if you have any type of operational questions, then I'd be happy to address those. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us another chance to talk about the project before we come in, hopefully uh, in February, for your review. Uh, a couple of things that have changed since the last time you saw the project. Uh, when you last saw us, the building was around 18,000 square feet. It's now uh, right around 16,000, hovering towards 17,000 square feet. And some of that has to do with just a little bit more conservative approach to the setbacks. Uh, last time we were taking advantage of some of the paper street um, opportunities and using those to um, create our setbacks. And this time what we've done is we've, we've used the true property line. Um, we've also had um, a, a couple of areas where there is still a transfer of, of land between uh, two property owners. So we want to we wanna honor the true boundary, um, which just makes for a little tighter setback. Um, which we think makes the project easier to review and approve, hopefully. Um, with that, the entire back bay of parking uh, that we were showing in the last one, which was pretty aggressive, and it did create some tree removal uh, between Acosta and the site. Uh, we've removed that. We've taken a closer look at our parking needs based on the other facilities. Um, and the parking that we're showing meets the need. And I apologize. I realized in our letter we're um, referring to 72, but there's really 69, and, and that was just a miscount on some parking spaces. Um, the 69 meets our volumes. You'll see in the next letter that's coming through uh, how that trades off with both the medical office building volumes, but also the community room volumes. And that um, rarely are they operating at peak times and overlap. Um, what you're likely to see is that the overlap times are in a medical office building down period and a more community-centered um, peak hour. So, for example, a lunchtime service that might be using uh, the community room uh, is going to be during a period where they're not seeing patients, staff have gone off-site for lunch period or just a, a, a respite, and the community room has has better access, access uh, for the parking. And then certainly in the non-peak or non-operating hours for the medical office building, that would create a surplus of parking on the site. So we really wanted to be a little bit more conservative about what we needed and how we were going to use the site. Um, the last time we were here, we did, if I look back at my notes, we did a lot of discussion about um, identifying an alternative sketch. And so in that letter that you have, you have the alternatives. We actually went ahead and put them into CAD with the same footprint and the same general parking so that you could see a more refined context as opposed to the, the sketches that I normally do. So that'll give you a, a look at what those alternatives look like and how um, it became complicated to fit the same needs, same circulation, same parking on the site. Um, the other thing that we provided um, was some illustrations to show context. One of the questions that you had was not just about the facade of the building, but how it sat into the context. 
SketchUp is not the easiest thing to print from. So what we've done is that we've um, taken photographs of the site, um, incorporated those into the SketchUp model, exported that SketchUp model, and then overlaid the proposed landscaping in it. So what you're seeing is as close as we can get to an actual contextual image. Um, and I'll actually I can show you what that looks like. So what that does. So uh, just coming from, so on a southbound <coughs> route one, uh, driving by Prime, this would be the great big pine trees that we see. There's that one that um, has fallen and is no longer um, alive. So it would be trimmed out. And what we're showing is the actual landscape, the actual plant materials that we're showing on our landscape plan in context. So we're not trying to show them fully grown. We're trying to show them what they're going to look like when we install them so that we can give you a very real sense. <coughs> um, Certainly the deciduous trees are a little fuller in canopy. We wanted to try and push those along a little bit so that you can see the idea of how we're trying to integrate the landscape along Route 1. <coughs> um, and you can just see the, the, the cars, Route 1, um, the facade of the building. But I think the most important one uh, that I think speaks to your concern, Susan, was that um, knowing how it fit into the site. And so this one I think is the most telling in terms of contextual alignment. Um, what you see is really not much at all. Um, you know, we could do a winter shot with all the leaves off the trees, but what you're seeing is the, you know, the overhead wires, the, uh, the intersection signals. Thank you. Is this working? Is it on? Yep. So um, what you're seeing is the, the intersection signage, you're seeing the traffic, um, you can see the parking lot, you can see this landscaping, you can see the facade of the building design, um, but what you aren't seeing is that kind of garish catch up type model. And then I think the other part, and, and Derek's much better at this because he's this building and he designed it, but uh, you can see how that building side is going to integrate into the landscape. It won't be a big, bold, garish, um, untreated side. And then just internal to the site, what we thought was really important is we wanted to communicate what it would feel like to the site, um, the ceiling garden, the trees um, buffering the landscape uh, between the parking lot and the entryway. Um, that just gives you a little bit of context. What I'd like to do is have Derek describe the building, <coughs> and then we can talk about any of the questions or any of the um, valuable input you can give us before we resubmit to you. It doesn't seem like it's working. <laughs> but that's yeah. okay. Okay. Let me get Good evening. You can also swing that other one around if you need to get over to the boards. This one, okay. That might, that might actually work better for me. Correct. Because it's on. Yep. It's not always obvious when the handheld one is on. It's more of a TV broadcast. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Derek Vey. I'm an architect with SMRT. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this project this evening. I think what you're seeing here is that we're, we're hoping you agree we're designing a project that very much enhances the fabric of that section of Route 1, the intersection um, that is in keeping with the design standards for the town of Scarborough and also obviously meets the needs of a contemporary medical office building. Um, I'll pull up the site plan real quick because I think that just a quick orientation of this before we get into the plan and the exterior is important. So, as you're well aware, this is the Route 1 corridor at the bottom. Um, the building is situated site-wise uh, such that uh, we're balancing really the needs for having a presence along Route 1, having the continuation of that fabric, but also um, meeting the needs of the <coughs> facility in such a way that uh, provides for a site that's easy, easily navigable for patients and their families and their loved ones who are accessing the facility. So you'll notice that the primary entrance is actually facing south-southwest. 
what that allows us site-wise to do is it allows us to bring people into the site and someone who's dro dropping off an elderly parent or patient um, has the ability to do so so that they can step out onto uh, the curb undercover uh, without having to cross traffic, which was a very important aspect to us um, as we designed the facility. So that's the primary entrance. A couple of the other um, secondary entrances, we have direct access into the community center uh, via this door here, and then there is an ambulance and staff um, entrance um, uh, at this corner of the building. There is a, a small service entrance off the back which will allow people to have quick access to um, the utilities in the building. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because the plan I'm going to show you is turn 90 degrees. So I'll do a quick overview of the plan so that when we get to the exterior you can understand how we're responding to the needs of the uh, facility. So in this plan, Route 1 is on the right. This is the primary entrance. Staff entrance is here and the utility entrance is um, on the upper left there. So you'll see that the building um, is organized somewhat like a T-shape where we have um, people entering into the lobby space and then from there they can access a community room space um, and Dick could speak to operationally how he envisions that being used. Um, the uh, primary community space is here um, which is about 2,000 square feet and again that has a direct access from the exterior and a, a covered canopy at that location as well. This is the drop-off canopy at the main entrance and from there that feeds into a contemporary model of care, contemporary delivery model for a medical office building, uh, similar in keeping to what we've designed at the Gorham or Biddeford sites if, you, if any of you have visited those. The staff zone is here on the right hand side which provides for some collaborative space for staff. So the way you can think about it is that the purple elements are really the caregiving space, the green elements is more the staff workspace, and then the pink elements are those community pieces that the public would be accessing um, more frequently. Are there any questions on the plan before I move forward? So on the exterior, and this is, I will point out, slightly different than what you received in your packet. We've made some enhancements to it. Um, again, to respond a little bit more clearly to the um, design standards. Uh, so on the exterior, what we're doing is we're really drawing from some traditional forms um, and through the use of the variations of the, the massing, the roof line, um, and other details, we're really trying to add some interest in human scale to the building. Uh, what we like to say is it's a contemporary take on the New England vernacular. We're using some very simple um, moves and materials um, to uh, really create something that's timeless. Is, was our goal. Um, in addition to the, the 6 and 12 roof pitch, um, there are a number of elements on here that are similar, again, as Dick said, to the Gorham site. Uh, we have uh, drop-off canopies um, and an entrance canopy at the community center. We have some accent canopies on those upper story windows which provide daylight down to the lobby space. That's a double height space. We're breaking up the form in the exterior to really respond to what's going on inside the building. So along the um, lower portions of the building on either side are the exam rooms where we have some higher windows to pr provide privacy. Above those are upper windows which provide clear story, uh, natural daylight into that core uh, staff workspace. Um, so really uh, daylight is very important in this facility and the, the exterior responds to that. Uh, the facade facing uh, Route 1 would be this facade right here. Uh, I like to think of that facade as having um, really the three season porch look. So there's the primary gable and then there's this space along the front which is the community space, uh, very open with glass, accented with some of the stones, and then um, also a branding opportunity for having some signage on the building um, really speaks to that, uh, that concept. We are looking at the green guide for healthcare in terms of informing our energy use decisions and planning for the building. Um, so that if, if you're familiar with that or with LEED, they're very similar to one another. Um, the, the dimension to the peak of the roof is 30 foot foot, 34 foot 4 to the peak of the roof. It is uh, 21.2 to that eave and 10 feet um, at the lowermost roofs. And so as we take a look at how that might look in perspective, Uh, in addition to what you've seen in your packet. That just gives you a, a better idea of uh, what the building looks like in perspective. Um, the stone is primarily reserved for 
the entrance areas as well as adding some accents and interest to the Route 1 uh, facade and the uh, community room space. And then to speak to the materials, uh, what I've put on here, since we've been referencing it, is an image of the Gorham facility. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the design of this facility and the design of, of uh, what was constructed in Gorham. Uh, the roof pitch in Gorham is 8 and 12. We're looking at a, a 6 and 12, so that's probably the primary difference. But the look of the canopy, the materials, the treatment of this facade with the, uh, uh, the upper windows and the, uh, the sunshade canopies is all very similar. We're looking at asphalt shingle roof um, it, um, for most of the building. A few areas where we have a little bit of flat roof, we'll look at an EPDM roof. Uh, but otherwise, it really, these are Class A um, materials. They are durable, low in maintenance, and as I said before, we hope that you'll agree that they're, they're really timeless, that, that white on white um, uh, New England vernacular uh, type of look. And um, I have samples of the stone if you'd like to see them. A few other materials that are on the building, in case you're wondering what the, the windows are made of, we're looking at aluminum storefront for most of the windows. Go back to this side. Perspective here. These windows up high, in order to get a little bit more <coughs> of a traditional look, we're looking at a fiberglass double hung window for those locations to enhance that facade a, a little bit more. Um, and the uh, clabbered siding that you're looking at would be a composite or fiber cement siding. We're still working through what that is, but something that has a, a good, strong, durable finish on it in white. Any questions on that before I hand it back over to Kylie? Um, I think we'll probably hold our questions until you're, you're all wrapped up with your okay. presentation. So if there's anything you'd like to add, go right ahead. Sure, the only uh, last little bit that I want to add is that, is that um, you know, overall it's an incredibly efficient site. Um, what we've done is we've actually managed to reduce the impervious on the site from the existing condition. Um, that's right around about 6,500 square feet. Um, but what we're also doing is we're treating 50% of the impervious on the site. So where, um, where the, exi the existing site had no treatment um, and just existed as you know, a, a kind of funny addition and um, areas of pavement, this is a, you know, it's a, a site that's de designed to flow together. It's being treated. Um, we have been working closely with staff. Um, and what you'll see that's different from your packet now to the next packet you'll receive is some of the stormwater strategies that have been done uh, with the suggestion of the staff. So, so I think um, what I'd like to do is answer any questions, get some feedback, um, so that we can give you the best project. Thank you. Before we go to board discussion, uh, we do have the opportunity for public comment on this item. It's not a public hearing per se, but. Um, some things at this stage, we just open it up for anyone who is interested in coming on up. Seeing none, we will turn to the board then. Nick, would you like to kick it off? Sure. <clears throat> um, real quick, what's the uh, horseshoe looking shape I see in the, I'm not sure if that's a rock wall or it's... It's a seat wall. It's a, it's a seat wall. Yeah, okay. on the uh, on the site plan, you'll ha have a lot more labels than you do on the cover plan, but it is a seat wall as part uh, of the healing find garden. It here, um, that's all right. Um, I was just curious. And then, uh, where where are you proposing to put all the snow? Yeah. Uh, the snow would be. Uh, it's a good question, and you you will see it delineated. So if you look um, next to the fire lane, there's kind of a large open green space. The area to the back of the parking lot, uh, we've accommodated a, a fairly good storage area, and then to the back of the drive aisle, there's also a fairly large storage area. Okay. Um, outside of that, I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, Thank you. I have no other, no other questions or comments. Thanks. Mike? <coughs> I don't have much to add. I mean, very attractive and um, proper use for that lot, certainly. I, it's not readily apparent on the plans that I have of that overhang, that canopy that you speak of. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a distance away from me, but on the plan that you have displayed, the yellow, it extends beyond the front of that, does it not? It does. 
Um, the canopy extends to the edge of the curb, so we like to call it a drive next to canopy. I see. It's not, you're not. Drive under canopy. Oh, okay. Right. So that if someone pulls up next to the curb, they can step out and be immediately under cover, but we don't have to be concerned about providing a canopy that's high enough to accommodate um, large trucks, for example. Okay. I misunderstood your intent. Um, <clears throat> are you looking for a waiver? A uh, 15 foot landscape buffer? Is that what I we saw? Are, the uh, and thank you for suggesting that. Um, we are looking for a waiver. Um, as we discussed the last time, there are a number of parking spaces that are at the front of Route 1. We'd like to use those to benefit the project. Uh, we are proposing a pretty hardy landscape in front of it, and it does go all the way up to the sidewalk edge. So, what I've done <coughs> is kept the large trees um, onto the property, but pushed the ornamental grasses and some of the perennials out right up to the sidewalk's edge, and, and we would like to ask for a waiver uh, for that. So as I'm looking at the plan, really the only area that you're asking of the waiver is to the left of the plan? Right, it's, it's yeah. in this area right here. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments as to how the circulation works as far as uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, any stacking issues as folks want to exit the area, et cetera? Uh, in terms of stacking, I wouldn't imagine that you're going to have a, a large queue, um, but you should have at least three to four cars coming from where you would be exiting. So you're not going to have anyone exiting, hopefully, in the one-way drop-off, um, but as they would circulate around, you could certainly have plenty of capacity within those aisles. Uh, is there enough room or does it make sense to uh, exit the property to have two lanes so one has an opportunity to turn right at the light or left? I don't think that um, that would be probably warranted and I don't think the signal could support it. Okay. But I, I think it's, if we see that, we do have the, one of the things we're saying is that um, I think they were going to look at it again three months after operation to make sure everything is running um, as it should be. I mean, you're not really reinventing anything. You have similar facilities. Right. And maybe on your next trip, if you don't mind, if uh, you could have some sh sort of short narrative that speaks to how, what the demand is on those sites as far as to, to the points that I'm making. Yeah, there is a... There's, um, the letter from our traffic engineer in the packet uh, mm -hmm. that identifies, I mean, it's its not a high use, you know, it doesn't have a very much of intensity, and even the comments from Bill Bray suggest that it will be lower than what's been there uh, okay. historically. Well, uh, so what are we looking for tonight, Mr. Chairman? Just a review of sorts? and It's really more of a, a check-in, if okay. the applicant understands they're not quite ready for mm -hmm. final approval. Yeah. All right. the check-in. All right, yeah. thank you. Well, it's very attractive, and I think you're uh, you're moving along nicely, and I look thank forward you. to your next trip back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Robin? Oh, wow. Sorry. Um, <coughs> everybody I on their coast. expecting that. That's great. <laughs> um, I would like to commend um, staff for uh, the um, in-depth in uh, work that they've done to this design, because as I was looking through it, I did... I had a few questions, for example, the long-term maintenance requirements for the stormwater structure, how that will be handled. Um, also about the construction general permit, but I understand that you're going to address that in your final um, submittal when it comes. Um, so some of the other sort of like rip out outlet details and the water quality calculations, it sounds like you're working with Angela and Jay Chase on that to update those. And um, I have uh, a question about deliveries and sort of traffic flow to, 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 to wonder, you know, you know, are there going to be a lot of deliveries to this area? Is there a lot of ambulance traffic expected? There's not a lot of ambulance traffic. Um, there is the, in the event of an emergency, um, which we've provided for in the back, uh, just to make sure that there is a dedicated arrival um, spot for them. In terms of delivery, uh, FedEx, UPS. Um, Nothing else as far as um, no. Yeah, the uh, primary care medical office uses a lot of small medical supplies. Okay. And actually, we have uh, our own internal staff, our procurement department, that 
that go to our sites and stock all the medical supplies. Excellent. So they, they come once a week and kind of you know stock the, the facilities. Excellent. Thank you. That's really the end, and I just want to, again, really great job to staff for uh, picking up on a lot of what I had, my questions were this evening. Thank you. Roger? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I assume that um, some of the comments in the staff report are still being worked out, uh, you know, like the, the dumpster and the, um, the generator pad and the bus stop and the signage and stuff like that. Yeah, the staff I, had a meeting with um, well, a couple meetings. There's been a lot of stormwater coordination that um, has been occurring, and then parallel with that, uh, we met with the applicant uh, representative just last week to kind of review some of the more of the site plan um, comments outside of stormwater. So, if they haven't addressed them already, I know that they're working on um, a response. So. Okay. Yeah, we will bring a response. I think um, in terms of the generator location, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that we. Uh, are clear in that the evergreens that are back in that corner are going to remain. If they were damaged, somehow we can't save that root ball. They would be replaced with a similar species to the sizes that we have um, consistent on the plan. Um, I'm not sure about the dumpster. There was a comment in here about the dumpster. Yeah. About um, uh, fencing, you know, um, around the dumpster. And actually in your prints I saw it. Sorry. Yeah, it has a dumpster yeah. enclosure. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the generator pad location and transformer pad, those are on the site plan. I think it was just a question of that additional buffering around them, uh, and we are going to make sure it stays in place. And the same thing um, about the lighting? Right, the lighting. The next plan will have the property line on the photometrics. Uh, we have shifted some of the poles back a little bit to accommodate some of the snow storage. Uh, and then in comments with the fire department, there was one pole at the corner of the building that we've mirrored over the sidewalk uh, in front of the building still, but just to give them a little bit more clear access. Uh, to that point, the two Zalkovas uh, that are on the landscape plan in the front of the building. So uh, where the canopy comes out, there's two large trees. Uh, those will be switched out to magnolia, so a little bit smaller and canopy more more dense, certainly not canopy bearing. Are those the trees that the fire department are concerned about? Yes. Okay. I could only find one, by the way, on that. Pardon? I could only find one of those on, the, on here. Oh, it's it's in the detail section in the corner. It's, yeah. Oh. So they're, they're here and here, respectively. Oh, okay, okay. It's just because they're cut out into the detail. Uh, I, I think the building looks terrific, uh, I think and, and I think the landscaping really looks good. Um, I'm wondering, um, the landscaping really looks good, <laughs> and I'm just kind of curious. Carried point. away. Here. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying oh to come to on! <laughs> There's not a single arborvitae <laughs> on there. I'm preparing you for two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of curious though, when you're traveling north mm -hmm. on Route One. Uh, you have your sign on the on the peak of the building, so I'm assuming that'll be good for people to see. Because I'm wondering with the with the landscaping you do have and the intersection, you know, the lights and everything mm -hmm. right there, and it's a multi-lane road. Right. Uh, it's important for people to know where they're going to have to get into the right lane. Now, what about coming the other way, heading south? Well, honestly, um, I think we're going to be a little bit more dependent on the sign than on the building branding. Yeah. Um, we do have, I mean, the, the trees in the front of the building, uh, we do have an elm in the island, and the larger island there, uh, and another elm, those two right there. Um, but those trees aligning the drop-off are pears, so a little more columnar, a little more tighter fit, uh, and really that's to make sure that we're not throwing canopy over the, the access, because that is our fire lane as well. So we want to make sure that's nice and clear and not burdened by canopy. So I think based on height, you know, everyone will have a good glimpse of it, but it won't be staring at you, screaming, this is Martin's point. Um, it'll be, it'll be well-placed. Um, you have a sign right now on the mm -hmm. south side of your access. Correct. Would it From make sense to be on the other side, the north side, so when uh, cars are coming? Yeah, I think, so on the north side, there's a number of utility poles. Okay. There's a handful of utility poles, plus there's the pole for the signal as well. And it um, it felt a little busy. Adjusted. 
uh, a little congested. Uh, we do have a bit of branding on the face of the building coming outward. Um, so as you're driving by, um, hopefully people traveling, you know, to the intersection will will know, you know, that it's the intersection that they're turning to. But I don't think that we'll. Hopefully, I don't think that we'll have a problem getting people to the building and getting them in. All right. I think it looks great. Thanks, Roger. Susan. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm the only one here with a very large landscaping plan. Let me move, okay? Yes, yeah, you please. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is because I truly can't read them when they're smaller. <laughs> I'm not going to say old anymore. Okay, so first question. To the left as I enter, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's where the sign is going. Yes. And it doesn't show anything on the landscaping plan as to what there is going to be around that sign for landscaping, but I assume right. it's going to be prodigious. It's just going to be lawn. It, that's that earth berm. Seriously. It is. And it's because we have landform there. So uh, essentially um, trying to take advantage of the landform itself as opposed to having a landform with a a okay. pod of daylilies on top of it and a sign jutting well, out of it. That takes me to the question of you're not planning on reducing the height of that berm. Probably not, no. Well, it probably kind of worries me. Um, because we are asking for us to say that you can have a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, people? The, the front parking. Waiver. Yeah, waiver, thank you. That, we're, mm -hmm. that you want a waiver for, to allow parking there. And there is parking there now. Correct. Which you can't see because of the berm. Right. We're not going to take, let me rephrase, we're not going to take the berm down, but I don't know that what we're going to do. We're expanding the grades so it won't have that huge point to it. It'll be a little but smoother. Well, you, but you understand what my concern is. I mean, you're, it, I, I don't want to see the parking. You're room. not going to see the parking. That's really all I'm saying. <laughs> you're not going <laughs> to see the parking. You know, I mean, but if you look at, if you do look at, because I know you don't have the landscape, you have the landscape plan big, but you don't have the grading plan larger. Um, we actually do need to move the sign back per the ordinance. So um, one of the things that we have there is that, so if the driveway itself is at 100, currently the top of that berm is at 102. So it's about two foot higher than the driveway itself. We're maintaining that, but we're spreading it out a little bit more so it doesn't have that, I don't know, elephant burial mound look to it. So we're spreading that out a little bit and pushing the sign. That was very good. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah, <laughs> so we're pushing that back a little bit. So you still have that kind of gentle berming to it, no, but you're okay. not. That's okay. Yeah. I get it. So putting a <laughs> pot of daylilies on the top just seemed more like, a, you know, honoring the, the elephant beneath. I missed something in the beneath. design of the sign. Pardon? I missed something in the design of the sign. Uh, it's on the elevations. And I believe there was a detail in the packet, but one of the things that we are doing is reducing the height of that sign. So you're going to use the sign that's there, but you're going to reduce the height of it? No, no. There's a, in the packet on, let's see, uh, AE201, and it's tough because I myself flip over it a number of times. I just did. It's in the lower left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. Can you bring it? It's okay. I mean, if it's there, it, I'll yeah, find it. Oh, no wonder I didn't see oh, it. Oh, my small. goodness. Oh. But there should be a, um, if I look in the packet, <laughs> let me, um, okay. Ah, there's the larger one there. Okay, I found it. Yeah. So on ex and in Exhibit 8, there's also. Yeah, I found it. Yeah. Because this is one of those situations where the whole signage on Route 1 when there's a change of use, we get to make sure that all the signage comes into a, into um, alignment. So for me, that's sure. one of the really big things about having you take this take over the use of this of this uh, site. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to uh, go over a couple of <coughs> questions from the um, comments from the from staff. Um, have we discussed the uh, the feasibility of an access easement on the westerly abutting property? We have, and we're actually going to show that on the next plan. Okay. So There's been some that. conversation. That's what we want to hear about. Good. Um, that, that was the connectivity part. The landscaping we discussed, probably ad nauseum. Um, we didn't even comment. There's not a single arborvitae on there. <laughs> That's why you didn't hear from me. <laughs> 
uh, it's working. This very subtle thing about arborvitae is actually working. <laughs> By the way, hawthorn, the, the hawthorns that you had, sure. that is a wonderful street tree. It is. And I'm so glad it's gaining in popularity, and thank you for putting them in. Sure. I'd be very happy with them, I'm sure. Um, the sign that you took care of. And then, of course, we're, we're still dealing with the stormwater management, and I'm looking forward to hearing how that's going to come. And you'll come back with the bus uh, shelter, suggested location for bus shelters and all of that good stuff. Sure. But you're right. It is good landscaping. It's not perhaps tremendous landscaping, but it's very good. Oh, landscaping. come on now. It's very, very it's good. It's not tremendous landscaping? Yeah. It's There's only so much that we can fit in this poor little site. <laughs> No, what I really want to say is that I can tell that a lot of time and effort went into it, and we very much appreciate it. And sure. thank you for making that effort on our behalf. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I don't have a whole lot to add beyond what's already been said and asked. Um, obviously, there are some things that are ongoing in terms of ongoing staff comments and responses to those. Um, we'll look forward to seeing details on the stormwater. Um, one question I had, and, and forgive me, I was unfortunately not here the first time you were in front of us. Um, sure. So sorry if I'm making anyone repeat themselves, but I'd like to just hear a little bit, maybe a Cliff Notes version, um, about the community use and, and how you see those hours uh, dovetailing with, with the regular business. Sure. Um, so within our traditional design, so what we've done in Gorham and in Benefit, um, there are conference rooms for the most part, um, right off our reception area. And the arrangement we have with the communities in Gorham and Benefit is that room is available for them to book when our normal clinic hours. So if there's a, a group, if there's a, we've had yoga classes, we've had Girl Scout clubs come and utilize our facility, um, th that room is available for the community to use. Similar to this building, we have the community room off the main lobby with the intended same use. It's our meeting location, but when we're not using it, the intent is for it to be available to the community. What's different about this location is we have a dedicated community space. And the details of that, to be honest with you, are still being worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, we've shared with, with uh, the town administration our thoughts, and we're continuing to meet and refine those even further. Uh, but the intent was that that ha having a separate entrance that could be used hours beyond our clinic operation. Separate entrance, separate exit, separate restrooms, and that's kind of our intent um, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, we, we're trying to be a partner within the communities that we reside, and that's kind of our approach on that. So I can't give you a lot more details on that, although we are continuing in discussions. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. Okay. Um, Beyond that, I would echo what a couple others have said and, and thank staff and the applicant for all the work that they've done on this to this point. I think this is shaping up to be a great outcome for this site um, and a relatively quick turnaround, at least as these things tend to go. Um, uh, architecture, uh, we haven't talked about a whole lot. I think that's because people are, are good with it. I, I happen to, to really like what I've seen. I, I do like that kind of contemporary um, take on the New England vernacular, as you've said. And I don't know whether that term's been trademarked or not, but, <laughs> um, but I do think that's a, that's a nice look and uh, will be a nice uh, addition to, to that Route 1 corridor. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see you in, in February and we'll look forward to seeing where you are. Good. Do you need anything done. more from us? No, right. Thank you. <coughs> Dan, do we have a town planner's report? Well, I was going to comment on our um, complete streets workshop that um, some planning board members were fortunate enough to attend last week. It was a workshop really of the town council, the transportation committee, who's been working on a complete streets policy for Scarborough for a number of months. Um, there was also uh, a few SEDCO members in attendance, uh, the town engineer, public works director. We had a good conversation around what complete streets mean um, and what they kind of mean to different areas of Scarborough. 
and um, got some good feedback and had a good discussion around it and you know what it what it means to Oak Hill and the more kind of developed areas of, of Scarborough as well as the rural areas and what are the different types of um, road designs and infrastructure designs that can provide accommodations for bikes and pedestrians and um, of course automobiles and to a degree transit ridership. So uh, that was a good discussion and um, we're now kind of finalizing the policy, the complete streets policy and, and likely provide it to the council for their next meeting uh, next Wednesday. So for those board members who want to kind of keep track of that, we can also provide the board that updated policy for year review um, because there's a lot of interplay um, with the planning board when you look at projects that are um, you know, throughout town, whether it's a new subdivision road, that whether to have a sidewalk or not, or um, how wide the road should be, and where there could be interconnections to other streets and, and neighborhoods to you know, commercial projects like Martin's Point. I think it's sort of indicative of complete streets when they're adding a bus shelter that would be Scarborough's third bus shelter. So, um, and first on Route 1. So, All we need um, is a bus. What's that? All we need is a bus. Yeah. <laughs> we have some buses. We have buses. <laughs> uh, awesome. Lack of awareness More around runners. our buses. So, Lots of buses. That's coming along, and I just wanted to mention it and thank the board members who were able to come last Wednesday, and kind of more to come on that. So, Thanks, Dan. Is there an administrative amendment report? There are no administrative amendments to the report. Okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any planning board correspondence? May I have a question about it? Sure. Um, I'm looking at the letter from um, Dan Dwyer that we got copies of, and it leads me to ask, and I probably should know, but do these kinds of res do we, these kinds of letters do we respond to them in any way? Our staff's department? been working on the, that issue for a while. Okay. So it's more for your awareness. It was in some ways kind of directed at planning board, but also town staff. So we just wanted to share the letter, not ask. Th and I'm not. Board yeah, it just leads but me to say that basically a lot of this sort of stuff, probably not, not necessarily all of this, but a lot of the things that come in, if, if they could just be connected to the people who are actually creating the issue, in most cases the developer, you know, <clears throat> I'm just making sure that actually somebody does reach out and say something to them. There's been a lot of coordination with the developers. Okay, as well. that's all I need yep. to know. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for asking. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So just for the record, we did all receive copies of this email from Dan Dwyer. And again, as, as mm -hmm. Dan explained, staff and, and the developer are working to address those concerns. That's correct. Any planning board comments? Um, do we uh, elect officers for 2016 anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> We're so good at we that. We can just go for anarchy. Can we do that anytime we <laughs> um, want, or do, is it an want. agenda? Is it something that should be on the agenda? We've handled it a couple of different ways in the past. Um, we've we've done it where we've had folks submit a slate to the secretary in advance of a meeting, and then we vote at the next meeting. Uh, at this point, we don't we haven't done that, uh, so I don't know whether folks have any <laughs> preferences. Uh, we could certainly. I think we should have a slate no. to well, think about. First of all, we have to, who is the secretary? <laughs> <laughs> so the three, the, Mr. Chairman, the three officers would be chairman, vice chairman, and secretary? secretary. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I'm prepared to make a motion unless you'd r you, you think it's more tidy that next, next meeting we have on the agenda election of officers for 2016. I think it's a good idea, quite frankly, to follow that protocol. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a big deal, right? No. One more meeting, it just right. is a good idea that uh, that people know it's going to happen, not mm -hmm. just us, but anybody who cares about that sort of thing okay. knows it is coming. Sure. Okay. But I would make a motion that we have that on our next agenda. Yeah. And I'll second that motion. That's good. <laughs> right. We have, a, we have a new board member. We have someone, a board member who's not here right now, so mm -hmm. I think all in all, it's probably a good yeah. idea. Okay. So, so we're just going to, at the next board meeting, we're just going to vote, or is there going to be a slate? I think what we can do is we can we can work through it's staff mm -hmm. yeah. um, over the you know the next week or so to communicate to uh, in terms of what what people would like for a slate and 
Chair. We can act on that at the. Is this going to be a high power campaign and everything? Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> You get three weeks to put your campaign together. <laughs> Super money. PAC is already. <laughs> I actually don't know anything about that. <laughs> so we can have that on as your first agenda sure. item after the minutes. At that'd be stuff. good. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. I think that'd be fine. Yep. Yeah. I mean, any one of us can follow the agenda. It's e it's easy enough, and then we can True. proceed that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I make a motion for. So again, agenda. thank Robin. Welcome, nice to have you. Yes, welcome, Robin. I, I, I'd just like to say I, I want to compliment Dan and the Long Range Planning Committee for the um, complete streets concept. Um, I've been, I went to that along with Sue, and um, I also went to the Gorham Road, the last Gorham Road workshop. And I would certainly urge residents of Gorham Road and those neighborhoods who feed into Gorham Road. To, if they're not aware of what's going on, to become aware of what's happening. Also, Angela, quite, you know, compliment her as well, um, because it's. It, I think it's very exciting. Another exciting thing that our very aggressive planning department is doing. <laughs> so it's good. Thank you. Thanks. With that, I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>